Suppose there are 2024 rooms, containing a total of 2024 squared insects. Would this actually happen? Well, hopefully not, but I'll carry on. Every second, one insect moves into a room with at least as many insects as their current room. So, for example, an insect could move from here to here, or from here to here, but not from here to here. The question is simple. What happens to the number of insects in each room over a long period of time? As always with a problem like this, we should investigate smaller cases of the same problem, and I encourage you to pause and do the same. If we step it down to two rooms and two squared insects, then there are three possible initial starting configurations. We could have zero insects in one room and four in the other, but here there is no other room with at least four insects so none of the insects can move. With one insect in one room and three in the other, the insect which is on its own is forced to move with the other three, ending us with zero and four again. Finally, with two insects in both rooms, one insect will move into the other room, and now we have one and three again, which will again lead to zero and four in each room. No matter what, at the end it seems like all four of the insects are in one room, this makes intuitive sense, since at each stage the insects are kind of concentrating into the room with the most other insects in them. We should see if this pattern continues with three rooms and three squared insects. It's pretty clear that the number of starting configurations grows quite quickly, but it doesn't hurt to look at an example. If we start with three insects in each room, then after one second, we will have four three and two insects in each room in some order. We can keep going like this, but notice that as soon as a room contains zero insects, in the remaining two rooms, each second an insect will move into the room with more insects. In the end, all the paths do end up landing at all nine insects being in one room, as we suspected. The previous observation could perhaps motivate you into trying an inductive approach, but there's a far more interesting and elegant solution. We want to study the general trends of what happens to our configuration of insects. Sometimes there is an overarching property, which is preserved, or in other words left invariant, by the move we make. Alternatively, this property might only increase or only decrease, or in other words, changes monotonically after every move. What I'm talking about are invariants and monovariants. A classic problem for demonstrating invariants is the following. If I write the numbers from 1 to 100 on a blackboard, and every minute I erase two of the numbers, and replace them by their absolute difference. Is it possible that after 99 minutes, I'm left with only the number one written on the blackboard? If you haven't seen this problem before, I'd recommend you pause and try this for yourself. The key to solving this problem is to consider the sum of all the numbers written on the blackboard. Initially, this sum is 1 plus 2 up to 100, which is 5050. At each minute, we take two numbers a and b, and replace them by a minus b. This means the change in the sum of all the numbers is a plus b minus a minus b, which is 2b. Importantly, we should note that 2b is even, so no matter what, since we started at 5050, which is even, and subtract an even number from the sum each time, this sum is going to stay even. Therefore, it's impossible for us to end up with just one after 99 minutes, since this is odd. 
This type of so-called parity invariant is fairly basic, but you can really get quite creative with the way that you define your invariant. However, returning to our main problem about the insects, we're trying to show that eventually all the insects end up in one room. There probably isn't any useful invariant property that we can use, but a monovariant could certainly do the trick. If we think about what is actually happening when an insect moves into a room with at least as many insects as their current room, it feels like the insects are sort of clumping together and becoming more spread out. Hmm, if only mathematicians had come up with a way of measuring how spread out a group of numbers are. Oh, wait, they have. The variance of a set of data tells us exactly how spread out that set of data was. The idea of variance is to see, on average, how far away is each data point from the mean. We could naively take the difference between each data point and the mean, sum these all together, and divide by the total number of data points we had to find the average. But unfortunately, all these terms end up cancelling out to zero, no matter what the initial data points were. We could perhaps take the absolute value of each term, but this tends to make the algebra more difficult to work with. The way that we solve this is to square the difference between the mean and each data point to ensure that it's positive. We can now consider the variance in the number of insects in each room after each second. Let xn be a random variable which is equally likely to return the number of insects in any of the rooms after n seconds. The mean number of insects in each room is 2024 squared over 2024, which is just 2024. We can now write an expression for the variance of xn. But what we actually care about is how does the variance change from n seconds to n plus 1 seconds? Suppose that at the n plus 1th second, an insect moved from a room with x insects into a room with y insects. Then the difference in the variance of xn plus 1 and xn is as follows. But this all nicely simplifies down into 2 times by y minus x plus 2. But since y is at least as large as x, y minus x is non-negative so the difference in variances is always positive. That is to say that every second the variance in the number of insects in each room always increases. But when is the variance maximal? Well, if all the insects are in one room, then any movement of an insect will cause the variance to decrease. But we know that at each stage, the variance must increase. So this configuration must be the one that we reach at the end. And we're done. What I found fascinating about this problem is not just how a concept from statistics made its way into an Olympiad problem, but also how this problem links to the biology of how an insect like an ant works. What we've effectively showed is that an insect like an ant can collectively group together in one cluster without any sort of centralised or coordinated effort. As long as each individual ant seeks to move towards larger groups of ants, they can appear to behave as one coordinated group. While this may seem somewhat obvious, this kind of principle where many simple individuals can appear to perform complex and coordinated tasks, appears throughout nature, and it's beautiful how the reason this works is rooted in mathematics and statistics. To learn more about topics like invariants and monovariants, I'd encourage you to head to the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant is the platform where you learn by doing. Whether it's getting hands-on with an interactive math lesson, or getting into the roots of programming and AI, Brilliant has a course for you. 
You can build your problem solving skills by adding brilliant to your daily routine. And what if you're short on time? Well, you can learn right on the go, on your phone, in just minutes, wherever you are. Whether you want to get started with programming in Python, or you're interested in how large language models work, you can head to brilliant.org forward slash polyamath, or click the link in the description to try everything Brilliant has to offer, free for a full 30 days. You will also get 20% off an annual premium subscription.